starting in three, two, one. All right. So um, we have, when we last met, we talked about Brown versus the Board of Education. We talked about um, Brown versus the Board of Education, the end of segregation, at least the Supreme Court's attempt to end segregation, right? What, do, what was the Supreme Court ruling uh, in Brown versus Board? What did they say about separate but equal? They, they said, said that. Uh, let's, go, let's go Emma first, yeah. Okay, they said like separate is inherently unequal. Yeah, what does that mean? Uh, Sam, can you explain what that means? So like, it's not that the, so it's like Marshall said that separate cannot equal fair or balanced. And the reason of that, like, because like the segregation, like it, it, the big thing was that like it took away like choice and like gave power. Yeah, takes away, right? Segregation is a manifestation of power, right? It's never about the bus. It's not about the seat on the bus, right? What is it? It's not about where you sit on the bus. What is it about? It's about it's power. About other people sit on the bus. It's about my ability to tell you what to do. Right, I'm in charge, you have to listen to me because I'm better than you are, right? So if I tell you to sit in the back, you sit in the back, right? If I tell you to drink from the left, le the drinking fountain on the left side, then you do that. All right, August of 1955. Okay, so this is just a couple of months later. So about how, about a half a year later, okay? Yeah, Sam, new letter. I'm make, make this a new letter. Yeah, let's make this a new letter, unfortunately. Emma, Emmett Till is going to get his own letter. All right, so Emmett Till, um, in a, a little town called Money, Mississippi, um, we have a boy named Emmett Till, and he is, I believe, I believe he's 13 years old at this time, 13-year-old boy. And in August of 1955, Emmett Till is visiting his family down in Mississippi, okay? Emmett is from Chicago. That's important for the story. He's from Chicago um, and Chicago is not a segregated city, okay? In Chicago, blacks and whites, you know, go to the same schools and work together and stuff, right? And, and some of the neighborhoods are pretty divided but they're not segregated by law. This matters a lot, right? Because segregation affects every aspect of a person's life. And segregation, Thurgood Marshall made this argument to the Supreme Court that segregation has a like traumatizing psychological effect on your brain, that it trains you into thinking that you are inferior, that you are stupid, that you are worthless, right? Like if you're the, the black person in a segregated world, that that segregation is constantly imposing that trauma upon you, right? This matters because Emmett Till does not have that imposed upon him. He doesn't act like that. So he's visiting family in Mississippi in that summer of Mississippi. And supposedly he whistles at this girl named Carolyn Bryant in the picture here, okay? Supposedly he whistles at her. There's actually no evidence really that he did this, right? But like a kind of whistle, right? She says, she claims that he whistled at her in a threatening way and that he came after her like he was going to sexually assault her and rape her, is what she claims. Again, he's 13. He's a 13-year-old boy. And she is, at this point, I think she's 18 or 19. Okay. Emmett Till turns up missing that night and they go and try to find him. They go and try to find him. Um, they're looking for him for a couple of days. It takes about three or four days. They eventually find his body in the river. He had been captured, beaten, tortured, and then um, tied to a big like metal fan, like one of those big wall fan things, right? And then thrown in the river that he had been tortured and beaten and thrown in the river and killed. Again, a 13 year old boy. Um, this 
uh, causes a big problem, right? They get together with a big uh, with a with a trial. They put this they put this on trial and they start to arrest uh, find these people. So Carolyn Bryant, the woman, she is she had told her husband Roy Bryant and J W Millam I think is her cousin I think or Bryant's cousin I think I forget right. These guys get arrested for this. Now, normally when somebody dies, the normal thing to do is to have an, a closed cut, an open casket funeral um, for like old people and stuff who die. That way people can come and see their respects and, and people can confirm and see the body. But when the body has been mutilated, when the body has been really damaged, you don't have an open casket funeral out of respect for the dead. Emmett Till has an open casket funeral at the request of his mother. Okay. This is Emmett Till's body right here. This is what happened to his face. She has an open casket funeral. Normally this would never happen, but she says, people need to know what happened to my boy. They need to know what these guys did to my boy. So this becomes a huge outrage across the country, right? Um, pictures of Emmett Till's body get published in black newspapers across the country. Black newspapers and black magazines, they put Emmett Till's mutilated body in their, in their newspapers in order to spread this around. Millam and Bryant both get arrested. They get put on trial. And at the trial, Carolyn Bryant testifies that Emmett Till had tried to sexually assault her and that um, these guys uh, get uh, these guys get brought in. They deny doing anything, even though there's multiple witnesses saying that they saw them. There's a an 80 year old black man who saw these guys pull up to Emmett Till's house. They saw them go into Emmett Till's house. They saw they heard it. They saw um, they saw Emmett Till getting dragged away. There's somebody who hears who um, hears screaming and crying coming from their barn where they had tortured Till, where they had tortured this boy, right? And then they didn't do anything about it. With Even with all of this evidence, an all-white jury finds them not guilty. Okay? This is very sadly true of the American South at this time. This basically always happens in the American South, that that whenever a black person is lynched, that the black person, uh, the white, any white people, if they're ever arrested and put on trial, they're found not guilty. Hundreds and thousands and thousands of black men had been, black people had been lynched and none of them, almost zero of them have ever been brought to justice, almost zero, okay? Emmett Till's murderers walk. They're found not, they're found to be not guilty. Eventually, Carolyn Bryant only just died recently. She only died maybe five or six years ago, okay? She died about five or six years ago. And on her deathbed, she said that she made it all up. Five or six years ago, she said, she said, I made it all up. I regret it. And I've been carrying the fact that I made that up, made it up. She says, and she said, Emmett Till never whistled at her and never tried to sexually assault her. She made it up. So she admits to making it up, but by the time she does that, she's already 90 something years old and dying. And she just died a couple of days later. So this is outrageous, of course, right? Um, it stands out, unfortunately. Unfortunately, there are, say it again, Sam? Did you have a question, Sam? Oh, I thought, I thought I heard you say something. Okay, um, this stands out for a couple of reasons, okay? First, um, Till didn't know, he didn't know the body language of segregation, right? When black people are walking on the sidewalks in segregated South, they're supposed to like avert their eyes away from the white people. They're supposed to step to the side of the sidewalk and let white people pass by. They're supposed to do all that. And Emmett Till didn't do that. He didn't act like that. 
he hadn't had that psychological trauma imposed upon him, right? So he acted like just a normal kid. And that's something that the white people in the town didn't like and they wanted to get rid of. They thought it was dangerous to have a Negro kid acting like a normal kid, right? And so they wanted to make him an example to everyone else. That's why it's important to the story that he's not, that he's not from, the South, from the North, right? He's missing. Um, also, when his body is brought up to the North, his body is displayed in Chicago, right? Where his mother displays the body. Um, this stands out because Emmett Till, first of all, is a child. Children aren't lynched nearly as much as adults. It's almost always adult men, almost always adult black men, okay? Um, so children are not lynched very often. I'm not gonna say never, but not very often, okay? Um, and children from not the South, right? So children from another place um, aren't lynched very much. Right, Chicago hardly ever has lynches. It's very lynchings. It's very, um, it's very much a like an American South thing or a small town thing. Chicago doesn't really have those kind of stuff. This becomes outrageous in the summer of 1955. Okay, this is after uh, Brown versus the Board of Education. Right, Brown v. Board was the year before. This is uh, the same summer where. All the students are protesting, trying to get into the schools. They're not being allowed into the schools. This is the beginning of master's resistance is happening at the same time. And this boy gets killed in Mississippi. Big number O. Big number O, the Montgomery bus boycotts, okay? In Montgomery, Alabama, in Montgomery, Alabama, we're gonna start getting a series of protests, okay? Um, we've talked about the buses, right? And you guys know Rosa Parks, right? You know the Rosa Parks story, okay? Why don't you tell me what you know about Rosa Parks? What do you guys know about Rosa Parks? Um, she started to, so what the big thing is that she did is that she she started not listening to the, like the black people sit in the back, white people sit in the front. Okay, all right. Um, what else can you tell me about her, Emma? I know like she got arrested for standing up for what she believed in. Okay, all right. Um, you guys know how old she was? Take 30s, 40s. You don't know how old old is? Okay, when I was taught about Rosa Parks when I was a kid, I had kind of conceived this as her being a little old lady who was tired and her feet were tired and she didn't want to get up, right? Have you guys heard that version of the story before? She's a little old lady that's tired and doesn't want to get up, right? And so she gets arrested for not getting up and moving to the back of the bus, okay? Um, that version of the Rosa Parks story is not a very accurate version of the Rosa Parks story. That's kind of the like elementary school version of the story that that people learn. Um, and it's not it's not very accurate. So first of all, the Montgomery Bus Boy Boycotts does not start with Rosa Parks. It actually starts with a girl named Claudette Colvin. Claudette Colvin. And she's a girl. She's 14. Come on now. Claudette Colvin, she's 14, 14 year old girl. And it starts in March of 55. So let's be clear that we understand our timeline here. This is before Emmett Till, okay? Emmett Till gets murdered in the summer of 55. Claudette Colvin is in the spring of 55. Cool, you guys with me on that? All right. Colvin protests the bus by not getting, she gets arrested by not getting out of the, not moving to the back of the bus as well. Right. Um, she's followed by Ariella Browder, an older lady who does it in April, Rosie McDonald, who does it, uh, or Susie McDonald, I'm sorry, who does it in October, Mary Louise Smith, who does it in October as well. Right. But Claudette Colvin is the one who's kind of the more famous one. She's the first one to do this. Okay. Um, Claudette Colvin gets arrested and then she gets dismissed. In the newspapers, they don't, she thinks that she's going to cause like a revolution, she's gonna cause this big, um, this big movement, right? 
but she doesn't. The movement never happens because of her, right? Why do you think it matters? Why, why do you think she fails to start a movement where Rosa Parks absolutely does start the movement? What makes you think, what, what, what's your instinct about why Claudette Colvin would fail? She was the very beginning. She's in the very beginning, that is true. Okay, what else? What were you gonna say, Emma? I think maybe because they weren't like taking such a young person seriously and maybe it's just like, okay, you messed up, but you're young, you're still learning. We're gonna yeah. smack up a bit, but just don't do it again. Just, and That's then perfect. Can... That's perfect. Emma gives us our perfect answer here, right? Claudette Colvin, you can put in the notes, Claudette Colvin tried to start uh, a movement, but she failed because nobody takes teenagers seriously, right? Emma, you said that just like a teenager who's not taken seriously, right? Like you're, <laughs> that um, if you guys have ever met teenagers, they're kind of the worst, right? Teenagers are kind of the worst, right? They all think they know everything. They all think that they can change the world and nobody listens to them, right? Am I, am I wrong, guys? Yeah, so um, Claudette Colvin, gets kind of smeared in the press. She gets, she gets kind of smeared as being like a troublemaker, right? That she's just some kind of punk kid troublemaker. The same thing happens with Susie McDonald and Mary, Mary Louise Smith. They all get labeled as just kind of punk kid troublemakers, right? And then nobody listens to these, to these teenagers. Nobody listens to these teenagers. Um, but there's something that happens, right? So Claudette Colvin's in the spring and then Emmett Till gets killed in the summertime and this movement is pushing forward. This is where we're gonna meet Rosa. So Parks, the first thing we need to understand about Rosa Parks is that she's not just some little old lady who's tired. She's a member of the civil rights movement, okay? She's an active participant in the civil rights movement. She was a member of the NAACP back in the 40s she worked with the NAACP. Her husband is a civil rights activist. She worked with the civil rights leaders, okay? So she's not just some little old lady. She's plugged into the movement. She's part of the movement, okay? She gets together with a bunch of the leaders, all these leaders that I have on my screen here. She's getting together with all these leaders and um, they are meeting in her house She's hosting them in her house and they're planning a protest of some kind. They think that the buses are a good protest. Claudette Colvin is inspirational to them, um, but Claudette Colvin couldn't really make it work because she's a teenager. Um, she also turned out to be pregnant as well. Um, and that was even more problematic, right? Because now she's a pregnant teenager, right? So she's even less reliable. But Rosa Parks is in her thirties. Rosa Parks is a respected member of society She's a seamstress, right? And she always has a reputation of being smart and being polite and being nice. And she doesn't cause any trouble, right? They decide that they have to do a bus protest and they decide that it has to be Rosa. Why couldn't it be, you know, Edie Nixon or Fred Gray? Why couldn't it be these guys? People didn't know who they were. Nobody knew who Rosa was either. Why couldn't it be a black man? What happens to black men in the South who rise up? He, he would get lynched. They get killed. A lot of black men get killed. It's extremely dangerous for black men, right? They get killed. It can't be someone younger because no one will pay attention to them. It can't be someone older, right? It can't be the Durrs, Virginia and Clifford Durr, because they're white, right? So that doesn't work. It's gotta be Rosa. She's perfect. She's in her mid thirties. Everyone respects her, right? She's a, a grown woman. She's perfect. So what she does, she starts to scout out the bus. She rides the bus every day home from work and she starts to scout out different bus drivers. She actually watches for a while and she knows which bus drivers are the racist bus drivers, which bus drivers are going to flip out, which bus drivers are going to be the worst, right? And she hones in on James Blake, right? James Blake is going to be the most racist bus driver. He's the one that over, he's the one that overreacts all the time. 
he's the one that calls the cops and, and flips out on people. And she also knows he drives his bus on Friday night and he drives the 6.30 bus, right? So she gets off from work, she waits, she waits, she knows she has to do it on Friday. She knows she has to do it on the 6.30 bus because she needs Blake to be the driver. And they arrange for other people to get at the previous stops to fill the bus up, right? Because she also knows that all the black seats have to be filled. So Rosa gets in, sits down on the black seats. So the way they would have the rows, right? And you have like a little sign on there that as white people filled in, you would move the sign further back and give the white people seats. Eventually you get to a point where the white people have all the seats and the black people are standing, right? So Rosa is sitting in the front row of the black row, right? The one that is going to be moved as soon as white people get in. And the bus is filled with people. The bus leaves, it calls up to the next stop. White people try to get in. Blake orders Rosa Parks to leave her seat and she says no. And he starts to yell at her. And he says, I'm gonna arrest you I'm gonna have you arrested, you gotta move. And she says, no, I'm not going to move. I'm really just tired of everything and I'm going to stay here. I'm tired, I'm gonna stay. So he says, I'm going to arrest you. And she says, do what you think you need to do, but I'm not going to leave. When the police arrive, she stands up, she leaves with the police. She does not fight them. She doesn't get dragged away. She doesn't fight. She doesn't you know, get beaten. She stands up and peacefully leaves with the police being arrested. And she gives us perhaps the greatest mugshot in all of American history. Look at this mugshot. This is a work of art, right? Look in those eyes. Look at that expression on her face. That is not a little old lady that just happened to get washed up into things. That is a smart, independent woman fully in charge of what happened and the cops don't even know that they've walked into her spider web, right? That she's set the trap and the cops walked right into the trap. She knows exactly what she's doing, right? I love this picture. You can just see this look in her eyes that she knows what's going on and she is, she's just like, you guys have no idea. Here's the deal. I said it had to be Friday, right? Why Friday? because it gives them a weekend before the court will hear anything, okay? So on the next day, now she gets arrested and waiting for her is E.D. Nixon. He's the lawyer and the head of the NAACP of Alabama. He comes to represent her, right? And on the outside, oh, here he is on this picture. There he is. He comes to represent her. And on the outside, we have Professor Joanne Robinson. She's a professor at Alabama State and she, um, she helps to arrange what's going on. What they do is they write, up, they write up this pamphlet. I took the words off the pamphlet, but they print it off. They distribute it to all the black, um, all the black churches in, in Montgomery, Alabama, and all the churches agree to do this. All right, so Emma, why don't you read this for us? Okay. I feel bad for like saying okay um, <laughs> I'm sorry other Negro women another Negro woman has been arrested and thrown in jail because she refused to get up out of out of her seat on the bus for a white person to sit down it is the second time since the Claudette Colvin case that a Negro woman has been arrested for the same thing this has to be stopped Negroes have no rights to hang on sorry I'm reading for if Negroes, Negroes have to, rights to. Oh, sorry, I like skipped over one. Negroes have rights too. For if Negroes did not ride did not ride the buses, they couldn't they could not operate. Three fourths of the riders are Negroes, yet we are arrested. Or have to stand over empty seats if we do not have if we do not if we do not do something to stop these arrests, they will continue. The next time it may be you or your daughter or mother. This woman's case will not come up on Monday. Will not no, come. Will up. come up. Oh, sorry. Will come up on Monday. We are therefore asking every Negro to stay off the buses 
um, Monday in protest of the arrest and trial. Don't ride the buses to work, to town, to school, or anywhere on Monday. You can afford to stay out of school for one day if you have no other way to go except by bus. You can also afford to stay out of town for one day. If you work, take a cab or walk, but please, children and grown-ups, don't ride the bus at all on Monday. Please stay off fall buses Monday. Joanne Robinson. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Emma. So Joanne Robinson, she's the professor. She writes this up and all of the people working with um, Rosa Parks, they all spread this out to all the churches, right? So on Sunday morning, all of the black churches get this notification and they all, the word spreads out. Monday morning comes, Monday morning comes and the entire, um, and the entire black community of Montgomery, Alabama goes on protest and doesn't write the bus. Okay, what should have been one day protest, it actually turns into 381 days. A 381 day protest, it lasts for an entire year because the protest works so well. It just shuts down the entire bus system. Bus after bus, day after day, these buses are driving and they're empty. They're stopping at the stop and they have to keep on going. Black people are just walking to work. They're carpooling to work. Black communities in other parts of the country start to send gas money down to people so that they can drive and carpool and, and get everybody. People are like walking miles and miles to work and school every day, but they're not riding the buses. 42,000 people participate in this, okay? Um, they, uh, it's led by this man, Ralph Abernathy. He's the guy who's the leader of the movement and also a young preacher who, a young preacher from Georgia with a lot of potential a young man named Martin Luther King. Nobody knows who he is yet, but some people think he's going to be a big deal. <laughs> and um, so they're involved in this, involved in this protest, right? This protest works really, really well. Alabama starts to lose tons and tons of money. The Montgomery is going to go bankrupt, paying for all these buses and not getting any money, right? Because they're having it breaks the budget. The buses are supposed to pay for themselves with wages, but it doesn't work. Okay, when they ask Rosa Parks, why did you decide now is the time? She cites that Emmett Till's murder is the thing that got her motivated. That she says, if they're going to kill a boy like Emmett Till, if they're gonna let that happen, then the time is now we have to do this. Okay, this is gonna be one of the first big successes of the civil rights movement, okay? It's nonviolent, it's nonviolent, it's, it's boycotts and, and protests, right? It's a, it's a protest that the white people can't do anything about and it works. It shows that nonviolent protests can work. It shows that this can happen, okay? This also features a lot of people who are gonna be part of the movement moving forward, right? Including Martin Luther King, right? He will rise up and become the leader of the movement, you know, shortly, but, um, um, this is where Rosa Parks is going to be get rise to fame. I think it's really important for our story that we understand Rosa Parks isn't just some old lady who was tired. Okay, first of all, she wasn't old. <laughs> so she's in her 30s. So first of all, she wasn't old. But second of all, it wasn't just that she's tired. She's a willful member of the group. She's a smart person. She's a strategist. She's planning this out. She knew which racist guy would flip out. She knew what bus to take. She knew how to do this, right? Like she orchestrated all of that stuff. And I think that that's way more important to understand about her story, right? A little old lady who's tired is okay. That's an okay story. But independent, smart woman who orchestrates an entire movement and takes down an entire city government, that's a better story. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, how do you guys feel about this story? You guys feel okay? Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty, it's a pretty cool story. And I know you've heard the Rosa Parks story, like since you were in first grade, like I know you have, like it's been coming forever, but um, I still think it's good. I, I think it's a story that needs to be, it's a story that needs to be told. And I, I think that if we put some new emphasis on it, Right, you guys are adults. You can start understanding things in adult ways. Right, so it's, I think it's, it's important. All right, um, I think that's a good place to lay to to stop.
it's a good place to stop. And we timed this perfectly, right? Black History Month starts right as we're doing the Civil Rights Movement. Hey, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't usually work out that way. 